I've changed a lot since I first visited the Balkans eight years ago. That's me in Belgrade in 2006. I was a 21-year-old college student back then and thought it was pretty damn cool. My country had bombed the place seven years earlier, and there I was posing for a picture in front of the ruins. That same day, I tried Rakia and Chevapa for the first time and loved them both. And then there was the history. Together, they formed what seemed to be a brilliant trifecta, meat, booze, and a troubled past. In other words, a great place to be a journalist. It's now been four years since I moved to Kosovo to work as a journalist. These days, I can probably count on two hands the number of times I've eaten chevapa in the last year. And while I still enjoy a good rakia, I've come to realize that I like the idea more than the taste. My taste in stories has changed a lot, too. I find myself less interested in what happened in the past than what's going on today and will happen tomorrow and the years to come. Over the years, I've done stories about political crises, war crimes, and corruption across the region. But when I look back at one story that received the most attention, it was a story that had nothing to do with any of these things. The story wasn't even my idea. It was my editor's. I've been chatting with her about another story and mentioned in passing that Pristina was clogged with people driving big American cars. She immediately perked up and insisted I had to do a story on it. The story was of little global consequence, but it was heard by millions of people on US radio stations and on the BBC across the world. Nothing I've done before or since has gotten that sort of audience or readership. The reason I think is pretty simple. The world has been hearing the same stories from the region for the past 20 years. This was something completely new, as trivial as it was. It allowed millions of people to learn something about Kosovo that otherwise they wouldn't have had the slightest clue about. It gave people, through a quirky story about quirky people, insight into modern life in Kosovo. And these stories matter, now more than ever. I'm going to say something slightly provocative right now. The outside world does not care about the Western Balkans anymore. The region is at peace and of relatively small economic consequence. Meanwhile, its patron states, the EU and America, are preoccupied with the rise of Putin's Russia and wars in the Middle East. The foreign media has followed suit. And with no one watching, troubling things are happening in the neighborhood. In Serbia, a young disciple of Slobodan Milosevic has managed to earn his country a prized EU candidacy while continuing to flirt with Russia and giving his state an increasingly anti-democratic character. In Macedonia, the large Albanian minority continue to be second-class citizens while independent media dwindle. And here in Kosovo, the prime minister's desire to stay in power seems to be trumping the democratic process. But good things are also being ignored, too. In Kosovo, young people are trying to carve out their own version of Silicon Valley. Meanwhile, the LGBT community is marching forward, quite literally in Serbia, where chauvinism remains a national pastime. Putting it all together, what do we get? Nuance. Nuanced stories, unfortunately, are harder to do but done right, they're often the best ones. So what then is Kosovo's story? There's the young European story. Remember that ad from a few years ago? It was about optimistic, attractive young people coming together to build a European country. And on the other side, there's the story of a failed narco state run by former guerrillas turned organ traffickers who serve the interests of both America and jihadists. But I prefer a third story. Unfortunately, it's a nuanced one about a young state that manages to move forward while shooting itself in the foot, where some young people are trying to change the world while others are languishing in it, where a government can be, can be run by greedy former warlords with troubled pasts and graduates of the Ivy League who want to build a better future, where rich history is both embraced and destroyed. In short, it's a place of contradictions where unexpected things happen, and I've tried to bring that through in the newspaper I edit, Pristina Insight. It's stories like that of the Fetahus, an Albanian family that has managed to prosper running a bakery in North Mitrovica. We ran the story last year right around the time of, of local elections, an especially volatile and violent time in the largely Serb northern Kosovo. It was especially bad for the Fetahus at a bakery in the mixed Bosniak Mahala neighborhood. Explosions had become something of a regular occurrence there. The family's story confirms that very dangerous reality but also shows that it's more complicated. 
For instance, one Serbian customer just describes learning the Albanian names of baked goods, saying that they wanted to address the family in their native tongue. And in the same neighborhood, grenades were being tossed into apartment buildings. Closer to home, earlier this year, students at the University of Pristina rose up. Their rector, Ibrahim Dashi, had published dubious scholarship in equally dubious predatory journals. It was the breaking point following other scandals and an overall frustration that the country's main public university was doing a terrible job of educating people. So the students protested, and something very strange happened. The rector stepped down. It's basically unheard of here that a prominent public official would resign due to public pressure. This was a remarkable moment, and it seemed like it should have been the seed of a much larger revolution, but instead it fizzled out. More than a thousand kilometers away in Ukraine, Revolution and strife have divided loyalties and identities. We decided to find out what this meant for a small, little-known Albanian minority in the southeast that dates back to the 1700s. As it turned out, that too is complicated. People are divided over whether they see their future with Ukraine or Russia, something unthinkable for most people here in Kosovo who know Russia as the most powerful backer of Serbia. Meanwhile, the Albanians of Ukraine struggle to preserve their unique identity distinct from Albanians here in Kosovo and the, and the region, culturally and linguistically, but Albania no less. We see these fuzzy issues when it comes to policy and governments too. Just the other day, we reported that the European Union persuaded the reluctant advisors of Kosovo's president to do something of questionable legality, extending the mandate of three constitutional court judges without the consent of parliament. It's a tricky issue, and I won't bore you with it, but there's one striking feature. It's that the EU, here spending millions of euros promoting the, law, the rule of law, is playing fast and loose with the law, while Kosovo's authorities are trying to follow it. So getting back to Rakia, Shababa, and the troubled history, the things that drew me in here, they are very much alive and well here and across the region, literally and figuratively. This cliche of the Balkans does have at its core an element of truth. And they're part of the character that makes this part of the world special. But as I've learned these past few years, that isn't the whole story. The whole story is a lot more complicated. Thank you.